in the program are actually able to advertise the next spring. Line. We all think, we talk, and we write. Now, there are different ways in which we engage in these activities, but there's something special about the different ways that we write. We can write in ways that can be extremely different, and yet at the same time, they can be equally respectable and admirable. And these differences become conspicuous, conspicuous not just in the written products, but also in the process of writing itself. For example, the different ways that we put the material together or put our thoughts together, or the different ways that we revise and edit our own writings. The Berkeley Writers Award Series, now in the fourth year, is a forum in which campus writers discuss all aspects of their writings. We are fortunate to have Albert Schell with us today to share his experiences as a writer. I'm particularly delighted to have the opportunity to introduce Orville, not just as a fellow administrator, Orville is the dean of the Graduate School of Journalism, but also as a Chinese specialist whose work I have long admired. He received his BA degree from Harvard in Far Eastern History and his doctorate degree from Berkeley in Chinese History. He has been an exchange student at the National Taiwan University and has traveled extensively in China. He has written 14 books, both, most of them about China, and has served as a television commentator for ABC, NBC, and also CBS. He has contributed numerous articles to various magazines and periodicals, and has received many awards, including the Overseas Press Club of America's Award for the best article on a foreign subject, and also the Page One Award for the best investigative story. Joining him today as interviewer is Steve Tollefson, who developed the Writers at Work series in 1997. Steve received his BA in English from Stanford, and to compensate for his affiliation with Stanford, he did his graduate work in English at UC Berkeley. Now, he has been teaching in the college writing program since 1973, and has received the Distinguished Teaching Award for his excellent teaching. Steve is himself a Berkeley writer and has published a number of books on grammar. And Steve will be starting with some questions for Aubrey about his experiences as a writer. So I would like to introduce Steve and Aubrey. Well, thank you, Carlo. It's nice to be here in, in this lovely room. Uh, and always nice to be at any event where people appreciate writing. Um, you know, when you write a book, uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about this as we uh, get into the question. You're never quite sure where you're going to end. And uh, indeed, I think that's the proper way to proceed. You have a germ of an idea and you follow it. But inevitably, you end up some other place. You kind of write your way <clears throat> into an understanding and a conclusion. When I set out to write this book, I had a dim idea about writing about Tibet and China and Tibet. I'd become interested in Tibet through China. But in actuality, by the time I was finished, I'd written a completely different book. It wasn't really a book about Tibet. It was a book about the way we imagine Tibet, which is, after all, our Tibet. And it's a subtle distinction, but actually a quite profound one. So I, I thought I'd just begin this um, session by reading a little section to you. Uh, in the beginning of the, the uh, a virtual Tibet, um, which talks about Tibet a, a, as a place and uh, as a myth. Because I think one of the reasons why we so are so interested in Tibet is that it has heavy mythic meaning to us. And we don't really care that much about Kosovo or Rwanda, Sierra Leone, other tragedies of equal proportions have happened in these places. But we really do care about Tibet. And the question is why? One may debate, of course, whether any place on our increasingly small planet remains untouched by the homogenizing effects of jet travel and the global marketplace. But what is not in question, however, is the yearning of disenchanted Westerners to believe in such places. Indeed, to acknowledge that such lands may no longer exist has seemed too bleak a thought for most of us in our modern life to bear. When in 1869, the British colonial government in India posted Elizabeth Sarah Mazzucchelli's husband to Darjeeling in the Himalayan foothills, she immediately fell in love with the area's fierce majesty and barren grandeur. What appealed to her about those 
perpetually snow-clad in remote mountains, was the thought that, quote, no solemn garden parties or funeral dinners, no weary conventionalities of society follow us here. Leslie Weir, the first English woman to reach Lhasa, told the Royal Asiatic and Roy Royal Central Asian Societies in 1931, we cannot realize how much we have sacrificed during these late years of scientific advance and accelerated speed, while the Tibetans have retained poise, dignity, and spiritual repose, all things she insisted that Westerners had, quote, lost in their hectic striving. Uh, one wonders what Miss Ware would have made of our contemporary Californian life, uh, which compared to 1931 is, you know, going at, at a velocity which would have left her, I think, truly stunned. Few places on the globe have been afforded better geographical conditions for remaining isolated than Tibet. Protected as it is from, the cent from Central Asia by the Kunlun Mountains and the deserts of Qinghai and Xinjiang to the north, from China by the rugged foothills of the Tibetan Plateau, and from India by the Himalayas. Never mind that it was not the quaint pocket-sized kingdom tucked behind the mountains that many in the West came to believe it to be, but was instead a vast, arid, and sparsely populated land as large as Western Europe. What mattered was how people wanted to imagine it. Fantasies of escape are naturally more powerful when rooted in, new, in real geography. The concreteness of an actual place helps us believe our romantic myths, that they are something more than baseless, chimerical dreams. As the Swedish explorer Sven Hedin wrote in his book, The Forbidden Land, Discoveries and Adventures in Tibet, romantic pleasure must arise from what is firmly believed, at least for the nonce, to be an aspect of reality. The antique and the exotic, war and warlike adventure, chivalrous love and duty, the supernatural in many shapes, which were once de rigueur as some of the ingredients of romance could only move on the strict assumption that there were real and even actual, that they had happened somewhere and to somebody, either in this world or in another. More than any other land, Tibet has provided just such an enticing target for a corpus of romantic transferences and has continuously fired the imagination of Western escape artists. Its very name, generally believed to have come from the combination of two Tibetan words, to mean, meaning upper and po, meaning uh, the name that Tibetans themselves call their land, has long summoned forth images of quintessentially exotic fairy kingdoms distinguished by spiritual attributes whose loss we lament in our own contemporary lives. Uncompromised faith, simplicity, isolation, calm, spiritual mystery, this is how Mazzucchelli described them after visiting the Pemionchi Monastery while in a trek in 1869 to view Mount Everest. Quote, strange as were the surroundings of these pagans and grim as were their symbols, how can I find language to express the majesty and grandeur of their worship, which impressed me more deeply than anything I have ever seen or heard? The Himalayas, which separate Tibet from the Indian subcontinent and whose, na whose name is derived from the ancient Sanskrit word Hima, and alaya, meaning abode of snow, were created by a geological upthrust of rock as India, then a vast island, collided with the Eurasian landmass some 45 million years ago. That tectonic collision of geogra geological plates created a 1,500 mile long range of mountains that rises up from the tropical rainforests above Burma to form a great snowy arc running westward through Bhutan, Sikkim, Tibet and Nepal to Pakistan, and boasting the highest and youngest peaks in the world. Sven Hedin called the Himalayas the most stupendous upheaval to be found on the face of our planet. The British explorer Edwin Amundsen described them as like a sea, the giant waves of which, driven by northern and southern winds, have changed to stone at the moment of their worst fury. And as Edward Birnbaum writes, of the Himalayas in his gorgeously photographed book, Sacred Mountains of the World. The sight of their sublime peaks, soaring high and clean above the dusty congested plains of India, has for centuries 
inspired visions of transcendent splendor and spiritual liberation. In the late 19th century, when wonders, quote, had become uh, by definition uh, scientific, when the church had increasingly lost power, and when the divine right of kings and royalty were fast failing, falling to democracies and dictatorships, the idea that somewhere there existed a feudal theocracy ruled by a compassionate god king and a colorful aristocracy that labored not for industrial production or colonial expansion, but for the spiritual enlightenment of humanity, and did so under gold and monastery roofs, proved irresistibly attractive to the disenchanted West. It hardly needs to be said that Tibet's snow-capped mountains and alpine deserts do not, in fact, offer easy gratification of our earthly needs, promised, for instance, by our fantasies of tropical island paradises with their palm-fringed beaches and azure lagoons. Indeed, until recently, Tibet was entirely devoid of most amenities. Tibetans did not even adopt the wheel, except for purposes of prayer, until the second half of the 20th century, when Chinese occupiers finally arrived. Most of Tibet is thousands of feet above sea level and possesses one of the most inhospitable climates on Earth. It has an indigenous cuisine made up of things that most Westerners have found virtually inedible. The, and, and through most of this century, it was populated by a largely nomadic people who engaged in only the most rudimentary personal hygiene. What is more, Tibetans have shown themselves to be capable of considerable savagery against one another, not to mention outsiders. And yet, this catalog of dubiously utopian attributes has seldom hindered rapturous Western dreams. To this day, Tibet is still imagined as the, quote, cure for an ever ailing Western civilization, a tonic to restore its spirit, as Tibet scholar Donald Lopez writes in his recent book, Prisoners of Shangri-La. To the growing number of Western adherents of Tibetan Buddhism, traditional Tibet has come to mean something from which strength and identity are derived. A land free from strife, ruled by a benevolent Dalai Lama, his people devoted to the Dharma. Though many Europeans and Americans have been captivated by other forms of Oriental religion, Tibet's brand of Buddhism, steeped as it is in tales of magic, mystery, including accounts of unbelievable spiritual feats, continues to hold a special fascination. Well, maybe I'll stop here and see if we can hold four. Thanks. Oh, okay. If this table comes crashing down, just ignore it. It very well may. Uh, can you all in the back hear us? I know sometimes in the room it's hard. Yes? In the far back? Okay. I want to start by saying that uh, the bookstore, in case you hadn't noticed, has a display of books, which you are certainly welcome to purchase uh, at, at the end. I also understand that some of you need to leave at one, so uh, you have class or, or other things to do, so we know that people will be getting up. We will end by, by 1.30. And I want to especially thank uh, <coughs> Alex Warren in the Morrison Room, Morrison Library, for helping to sponsor uh, this event. Uh, when you go to the table and buy a book, uh, I think they're all wonderful. Uh, the one that Orville read from uh, Virtual Tibet uh, is especially interesting. I hope we'll devote some time to talking specifically about it today. But now I want to start with the grilling. Uh, for some reason, your work makes me do math. And so I start with, with some math. You are the sole author of books that total 2,839 pages. Wow. <laughs> you counted that, though, right? You, no, I haven't. You, you've written a minimum of 200 articles, and that's a conservative estimate because they often appear in some forms in the books, and I, I know they've been changed. You have a minimum number of intros to books and chapters in other books of 12. So that's probably close to 4,000 pages. And over 30 years, I can't believe I can do any of this math. Over 30 years, this comes out to roughly one published page 
a day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the question then is, how do you find time to write? Because I assume that not every word you've ever written has been published uh, and that you do some revising. So how much time do you devote in a given day to, to writing? Well, you know, since I've, I've become a bureaucrat, uh, uh, being a dean, uh, I have less time to write. But in actuality, uh, you know, for me, people say, well, how do you find time to write? It's tough. But in actuality, the writing part, for me, is peace. There's nobody pecking away at me, no phones ringing, no, no crises breaking, roofs leaking, students having problems, faculty to be hired and fired. Um, and so, I mean, I love writing. It's a retreat for me. I'm alone. I can think. The world kind of shrinks. And so I fiercely find the time. Now, it's, it's always a problem if you have a family. I have two young children and uh, many other things to do, and I have an alleged life to lead. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think I could survive. I mean, once you become a writer, it's really hard not to write. It's not just that you want to produce those books and you know, get them out there. It's there's something about the process that, of doing it that gets almost addictive. Well, let's take that last part, the process and the addictive. What, can you say any more about that? What, what is it about the process? Well, you know, most of, uh, I, I, in the last two years, I've actually more or less moved to Berkeley, but I've traditionally lived out in West Marin on a ranch. And I, the place where I wrote m m most often in the last few decades was there, a little house it's separate and all alone looking out on the ocean. It's re really beautiful. I, I just feel comfortable there. That's the place where the world seems to have manageable proportions. My books are there. My, all of the things I need are there. Uh, you know, it's very different from being on United Airlines, you know, racing around the world as I have to do when I leave that little place. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, my life has changed since I've become a dean. Um, and it's, it's really interesting in a totally different way. But uh, I've seen many people who've taken on bureaucratic roles lose their writing function, lose their ability to do that. And, and not only am I incredibly insistent that our faculty not do that, because after all, we're journalists. You know, you don't write, you don't make films, you're, you're, you're sort of not what you're alleged to be. But I don't want to do that. So it's a battle. But I, I, will, I intend to prevail. I, <laughs> I was thinking about the other administrators on campus, but we won't go there. Uh, can, you, can you tell us more about the, this setup? I was talking to my students about how they write and how we all write and what we need. And so one of the questions is, in this, this room, do you, do you have music? Do you need silence? Do you eat? Do you, have, do you procrastinate when you go in there to work? Uh, I don't have music. I find, I mean, I love music and listen to music all the time, uh, but I can't write with music. Um, eating when you're writing is a danger because it is time off. It's also time when you can read discretionary things, and so one tends to linger at meal times to, to not go back to the slag heap of writing. Um, do I procrastinate? You know, the busier you get, the less you can procrastinate because you don't have a lot of time. One of the dangers of people who do nothing but write is it seems like they have all the time in the world, and many of them never get to work. Now that I'm a bureaucrat, I live in the deficit world, a scarcity world, so I tend to seize the hour. Uh, but I still find you have to have a good place to work. You have to have a place you want to be. I'll tell you a funny story about this little studio. I was one, mo one morning I was sitting there writing. Actually, I was talking to some editor in New York. This is really out in the wilds. It's very near a wilderness area, which is part of its charm. Nobody knocks on the door. You know, you can dress utterly abominably and risk nobody coming to think you're a lunatic. Uh, but there I was talking on the phone, and I looked out the window, and I saw something move. And it was a, uh, a mountain lion. And the mountain lion had in its teeth one of our chickens. And uh, I, I'd seen this mountain lion around. So I said to this editor, I said, excuse me, uh, but there's a mountain lion <laughs> outside walking off with one of my chickens. And I, <laughs> I put the 
phone down on the desk and I ran out and I chased the mountain lion down the hill. Uh, it tripped and almost dropped the chicken, but alas, it didn't. So then I ran back up to my office and was a bit out of breath and was, had to try to explain, you know, this odd circumstance to this man in New York. But it, it did remind me that, um, you know, this was an important place to, for me. And I think everybody, everybody who writes needs such a place where they can actually have their things around them, where they can get into their cocoon, where they can have a certain solitude, uh, and they can do their thing. I want to ask you uh, in a couple of minutes uh, some more about that room because it, you, you talk about it in uh, the introduction to Discos and Democracy. A uh, couple more things though along, along these, these lines. Uh, do you use uh, a computer? Do you handwrite? These are all sort of generic <coughs> questions that actually everyone wants to know is, and is afraid that they seem too simple, but they, they really aren't. And do you write on the plane? You, um, because you are traveling a lot. I do use a computer, and uh, I'm not particularly enchanted with computers, but I, I find it extremely helpful. Uh, I do kind of write on planes, but I find I can't write anything very good on a plane. I can write a grant proposal, I, you know, I can edit something, uh, but I can't really be inspired. Uh, there's something about it. Uh, although actually, uh, it's, it's a rather sad fact, but I, I like planes because again, it's one of the moments when there's peace. And life, uh, as Ms. Mazzucchelli pointed out in the section I just read you, life is pretty hectic. And I think there are fewer and fewer places in life, which is why I like writing, as I've said, where life does sort of stop. And it actually does kind of stop when you're in a plane. Now that, pro that is a mutant form of, uh, of, of kind of Zen meditation, I know, but uh, we, are, we find our, our respite where we can. So when, you, when you're writing, uh, a couple of questions come up. One is how much do you, do you revise? And, and maybe I can ask in, in a couple of ways. How much do you revise in the notion of re-seeing and how much do you fix, which is you know, slightly less? intense thing uh, than revising. And then, then someone I talked to wants to know, how do you know when you're done? Well, I'm an, an, an enormously ardent believer in re rewriting, rewriting, rewriting. And you know, having written as much as I can, I have, I, I, I know that that's how good writing gets done. That very few people, and I mean almost nobody, is born as a good writer, you sit down, you write it, it's done. Maybe you can write an 800 word column like that, but you can't write any, anything of consequence that way. I have a wonderful editor who I've worked with for years. I had a marvelous editor at the New Yorker who I really learned to write with by going over things scores and scores of times. And in fact, at the journalism school here, we've started a, uh, a kind of a, a class for everybody who does print uh, a sort of editing workshop. And we bring in five, six of the greatest editors in America. And their job is simply to work with three or four students to do the 10 drafts it takes. The real problem, in my view, with, with people's view of writing and their assessment of their abilities is that they, you know, on a scale of one to 10, they get to two or three. And they think they're done. And it's rotten. And they think they're no good. And this is never more true than in academia, you know, where I, I find many people have no concept of, of, you know, how to get from three down to ten. And the whole relationship of writer and editor is not what it used to be. Things have sped up. There isn't the same fineness, the same sense of, of the necessity of time and rewriting over and over with an editorial eye. That's how the good writing gets done. And, and I think that until you've actually done that process once or twice, you don't quite know where you are in it. And it's very depressing when you write something and maybe you send it into a publisher or a magazine or a professor and um, you think you're done because you got to the end and you put the period. But in actuality, you're not anywhere near done. Intellectually, you're not even done, never mind whether the writing's any good. And you only get intellectually done by doing it again and again and thinking it through and writing your way to a conclusion, often with the help of somebody helping you look at it and edit it. Well, so who does look at your work? 
Well, I have this, as I say, this amazing uh, editor who's also one of my closest friends uh, in New York. Uh, has edited many of my books, and when I really get in a jam, I'll send him something that he has nothing to do with and ask him to look at it. He is ruthless, and I love it. I mean, I, I think to be a good writer, you have to be a bit of a, of a masochist because you, you, you actually want the editor to be relentless and tremendously critical because you're both on the same team, if in fact you're both on the same team. I mean, some editors may be sadists, I don't know, uh, and not be on your team, and then you don't want to be around them. But uh, so this, this is a very important relationship for me, and uh, it's not only because I continue to have it, but in the process of having it, I, l I think I've learned how to do it in greater measure myself. But still, writing, writing is an antiphonal process in my view, uh, particularly for long works that get muddled. You get lost. You don't know where you are. You don't know where you're trying to go. You don't know how to get there. And you need someone to come in with a machete and hack all through it and say, you know, aren't you trying to say this? Not to violate you, but to, to help you kind of say what it is you want to say. I don't suppose you would be willing to draw any lessons from that for freshman writing courses on the off chance there were any students here from <laughs> freshman well, writing courses about ruthless but on the same side and revising. I mean, I think any of you who are freshmen in a writing course, if you can get anyone to pay attention to you and really edit your stuff, no matter how harsh. I'll tell you a story. When I was in college at Harvard, I couldn't write. I wanted you just to know this right up. I was in an honors, whatever it was, tutorial, and my tutor I remember, because I found this paper not too many years ago, uh, he, I, I had written some paper on Confucius. It was incredible. And I found this in a trunk and was looking at it. And it just made me crack up, because you know, it was covered with red marks. And it went on for a few pages. And then I made a gaffe of such monumental proportions, I squirm even to tell you. But I had said something like, you know, Confucius was a, a courtesan in the court of Lu. <laughs> well, I meant a courtier. <laughs> And you know, after all of this read, my tutor wrote in the margins, oh my god. <laughs> and there was no more read. <laughs> well, you know, OK, uh, I, I was not born a writer. And I don't think many people are. You really have to learn how to do it. And it's very hard work. And you've got to learn, I mean, Presuming you know how to see the world, you have an imagination, you have a sense of humor, you have a sense of uh, you have a brain, a few other key elements. But the actual craft of writing is a hard-won battle that is learned by doing it. This, this actually makes it now a nice counterpoint to an earlier Writers at Work featuring someone you know, Fred Cruz. Uh -huh. um, who also was at Harvard, I believe, maybe he was at Yale. Who published his first book as a senior, so it's nice to hear that not everyone does that who then goes on to be a success. That we, I mean, you know, some people have, some have beginner's luck and some people don't. Uh, I have a question that, that doesn't quite fit anywhere, uh, but I think it's an important one. My students read uh, an excerpt from uh, Virtual Tibet that appeared as an article in The, the Nation uh, about Hollywood. And there were a lot of quotations from, from actors and actresses in there. And their question was, when you are out there in the field, are you using a tape recorder or are you taking notes? They were interested in the length of the quotes that you had from these people and wanted to know how you, how you got those. Well, generally speaking, if I'm going to do a sit-down interview, I do use a tape recorder just because accuracy. You just can't keep up. And also, when you're doing an interview, uh, in my experience, what you really are aspiring to is not just, you know, what's the color of your tie, what's your name. You really want to get a conversation going because that's where you really can draw people out. To do that, you have to be mentally available, which you have a, it's very difficult to do when you're taking notes. So I use a tape recorder. Uh, when I'm just sort of prowling around and hearing things and talking to people quickly, uh, then I'll use a pad. Uh, later, I think, we'll ask you where some of the quotations then come from, because we were very amused by some of them. I would like to read a little bit just from the, the very opening of uh, Discos and, and Democracy. 
Uh, this is describing your, your office. The placement of each book was as known to me as the keys of a piano are to a pianist. Even in the dark, I could reach up and pluck any book I wanted from its place with as much ease as a virtuoso striking the right note on a keyboard. If one looks at your books, there, there's so much information in these books. I mean, there's so much history, there's so much modern politics, there's everything. So the question is, how do you, when you're writing, how do you organize this information that you have? <coughs> do you have it on cards? Do you have it in computers? Or is it just that you know where it is? And it's a mystery to a lot of people how someone can do that with this much information. Well, I do keep files. Uh, for whatever project I'm working on. But I think, you know, the larger observation I would make, and, may, and in a certain sense this is changing now in history, but, you know, here we are in a library. Um, I, I think for anyone who aspires to, to, to have a writing life, it's really important to have a library. And when you read a book, don't just take it out from the library if you can afford to buy it. Because after you've read a book, in a, in a very sort of organic way, it becomes part of you. Now, I even underline, I mean, unless it's some, you know, really precious old book or something, uh, because ever after, I know where that book is in the shelf, I know where things are in the book, and I can find it again. And you would be surprised, things you think you'd have no interest in 10, 15, 20 years later. Suddenly you remember, oh, I know, th 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 that's a good place to look, and you know where it is, and you go get it. So if you have these things around you, you save yourself a huge amount of aggravation, uh, and you build up this kind of cumulative uh, resource space. And uh, I, I, I'm just a great fan of libraries and, and for people to have their own libraries. I know it's not something students readily do now with so many things online. But, you know, I, I, the online is fabulous, and I use it all the time, but it, it only goes so deep. And, of course, a lot of things aren't online. I mean, history, literature. I mean, who the hell wants to read, you know, Charles Dickens online? Uh, I mean, it's counterintuitive. So let, let, let this be a little pitch for you all to, to think in terms of being collectors of the books that you have read and that have been through your lives. Keep them with you. I want to, to continue that by reading just one brief detail, if I can find it. Uh, this, this is following on how you, how you know these things, how you keep them, them organized. I can see you having the books and knowing what's in them, but I want to know how you retrieved this detail for <laughs> uh, virtual Tibet. Um, this is, this is about the, the movie uh, Kundun. Yeah, Martin Scorsese's film. Right. Scorsese had been urged to undertake the project by scriptwriter Melitha, Melissa Matheson, wife of actor Harrison Ford, who had become an avid supporter of the Dalai Lama. She had previously written scripts for such films as The Indian in the Cupboard, E.T., uh, and E.T., which led the British Sunday Telegraph to describe her as something of an expert on lovable bald exiles. <laughs> uh, boy, I don't know where I got so, that. So, <laughs> you know, it's not, it doesn't strike me as the kind of detail you would have go, you know, noted and said, oh, I'm going to use this. So does it just, does it just come back to you? Do you just happen on And there are a lot of them like that. Well, you know, uh, I mean, this actually, with the internet would be good for things like this because you could do searches on, of recent articles. But I, I tend to be very much like a vacuum cleaner when I get on a project. And each of these books takes, you know, three, four, five years. And so when you're traveling, I mean, I always carry a Swiss Army knife and I'm slicing things out of newspapers and ripping, again, poor old United Airlines, their magazines apart. and taking things home and filing them away. I mean, you have to be a real pack rat when you're a writer. And when you see things, you grab them. You don't say, oh, I'll come back and get it, or I know where this is. You'll forget. So I go around the world lugging, you know, um, immense amounts of, of clippings, books. I mean, I will go someplace and come home with, you know, 100 pounds of, of material. And some, some of it I won't use right then, but ultimately, I salted away in my library, and you'd be surprised what a comfort it is to have it when you need it. Earlier, 
you, when you were talking about uh, virtual Tibet, you said that it started out to be one thing <coughs> and then became a, a completely different book. For, for those of you who don't know the book, it's organized, and I want to talk about this a little bit later. It's organized as, as all the a history of all the people who've tried to get into Tibet, uh, mirroring your own trying to get into the set of the movie Seven Years in Tibet, um, something that didn't dawn on me till about a third of the way through the book. Uh, but what does it say about <coughs> writing or your own writing that you started in, in one way and it ended up to be a completely different book? You know, it says that you never quite know where you're going. And I think it, one of the fallacies of inexperienced writing is that you, you, you have a conclusion uh, that's in search of a beginning. Now, it's not a bad way to start. You all always need to have some sort of animating impulse. But my experience is that really interesting writing is a process of discovery. And uh, often you change your mind, you change your focus, you think you're doing one thing, you end up doing something else. And it's a real problem in this modern day and age because, you know, uh, the way magazine assignments and book publishing contracts are uh, constructed. You know, you may run right into a brick wall. I had an interesting thing happen to me on virtual Tibet. Um, way back when, when I first agreed to do this, <clears throat> there was some German publisher who gave me some money and signed up to get German rights. Well, when I finished the book uh, and sent it off to Germany, they said, <clears throat> we thought you were writing a book on the Yangtze River. <laughs> well, it actually turned out way back when, I too thought I was writing a book on the Yangtze River. Uh, how I got to Tibet, it's another story. Uh, but, you know, it's only to say that, you know, the world does conspire against sometimes this, kinds of, this kind of self-discovery, this kind of following where it is you need to go. You know, you go to a magazine and they say, I want an article on North Korea, and you bring them something on, you know, Tahiti. They're going to uh, not be pleased. I want to spend a little while talking about the evolution of, of your writing. Uh, of the books that I have here on the table, uh, the latest, Virtual Tibet, about 10 years ago, Discos and Democracy, uh, a few years before that, Modern Meat, and then 1978, I think, Brown, which is the biography of, of Jerry Brown. So rather than my telling you what I see, I want you to tell us what you see as ev an evolution in your own writing, if you do. <clears throat> well, I started off, interestingly enough, here at Berkeley, uh, working. A professor uh, asked me if I would help him edit uh, or work on a book that he had been asked to do by Random House on China. And before we were done, uh, we had three volumes, and he'd asked if I wanted to co-author it with him, which was wonderful. And it was a real apprenticeship. And it, was, it, it imbued me with a very deep respect for sort of master-apprentice relationships as, as the way to, 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 to really learn writing. Um, <clears throat> but that set me off on the China path. I mean, I'd already been in graduate school here in Chinese history. But as I did that and did a few books on China, I also had a yearning to, to sometimes come home, not always be out looking at someone else. So I, I began to try to alternate, when possible, between one book about Asia or China and then you know, one book about something else that interested me. And I guess the first one was, well, actually, I wrote a book about the town where I, I lived, Marin, and then I wrote a book on China, and then I wrote this thing on Governor Jerry Brown when he was a really hot property, as they say in Hollywood, uh, when he was governor and ran for the presidency the first time. And it was nice because uh, it, it meant that I wasn't too sort of mono-dieted. Uh, uh, and then I actually uh, wrote some more books in China. And then, because I lived on a ranch, uh, ran the ranch, um, I got very interested. I mean, it seems utterly incongruous, I know, to sit here and tell you this. Uh, I got interested in the subject of meat and got a fellowship uh, to roam around the country to see how the technology of raising meat. And that out of that came a series I did for The New Yorker on how meat was raised now, how that different from the way it used to be raised. And, and the book was Modern Meat. Well, so I have a kind of a shadow life here that, you know, the, the, the sinological world sort of doesn't quite know about or 
get the other part of my writing life, but I consider myself you know, a writer, not a sinologist. Someone who cares a great deal about China, has followed it my whole life. My wife is Chinese, and, uh, but I, I don't want to be limited so by one subject. Um, I think you know, it, it, it tends to, to numb you out if you just can't jump the fence ever. I just a uh, little sidelight about modern meat. Uh, I sort of encourage you to read it, but I don't encourage you to read it. Uh, I am not particularly a vegetarian. Uh, but I certainly feel like I should be after reading the, the book. Uh, every time I go to the <coughs> store now, I sort of run through the list of chemicals and ingredients that have been pumped into these animals, and it's, it's pretty awful. Uh, there are a couple of quotations, too, on your program uh, from that book that I want to talk about uh, a little later. How would you describe your style, if, if, you, if you can? And has that style <coughs> changed? Or does it change? Clearly, it changes from book to book. Um, but is there any sort of progression or, or movement that you can see over the years in your style? Well, you know, when I finished here, finished my orals, I remember skipping down Telegraph Avenue and knowing I was never going to be an academic. <laughs> uh, and being so glad that I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a journalist. Here I am back, of course, as an academic, but um, uh, never mind. Uh, I think the way, you know, I, I, I think I discovered a kind of a, a, a really interesting literal where two worlds overlap for me, and that is a place where the scholarly world and the journalistic world can kind of cross-pollinate. I got a lot out of being, uh, you know, in the scholarly world, and I still read scholarly journals and keep up on things uh, because it's part of my life. But I didn't want to be uh, limited to that. And that, for me, is a place I've always been. I think the tone, the style of writing has always existed on that area of overlap. And it's a good place to be for me. It's a place, unfortunately, though, in the world, I think, has less and less demand for, because there's so few places where long, thoughtful pieces of writing can be published. I mean, I came of age writing at the New Yorker, <clears throat> you know, where you could just go on and on and on, and uh, two parts, three parts, four parts, um, and the object was don't let your your mind be limited by the fact that you'd been assigned so many words. But that's not happening anymore. And so the, the question is, where does a writer who, who, who likes to publish things that are, in a certain sense, historical, literary, but also involve their own views, their own looking at the world uh, that are long, uh, where, where, where do you go? There are very few places. So that's a real limitation. But nonetheless, I, I, I think this overlap area is where I like to be. And it's not an area that um, is really has a school of, of writing around it. But there are some wonderful people who, who inhabit that world. Someone like John McPhee, uh, you know, who's a master of many trades, but tremendously diligent in what he looks into and brings a lot of information and a lot of history uh, to bear on his writing. So you, you said that, that there's a sort of a literary component to this, and, and I see that in your writing, but what, what do you mean by that? I mean, I think it's important, <clears throat> you know, the reason why I, I wouldn't like to think of myself just as a reporter. You know, you go out and there, they, there's a cat on a flagpole and you write the story. Uh, I mean, that doesn't really interest me, you know, sort of newspaper reporting per se. I think it's a good exercise to learn, but I think the kind of writing that I esteem is writing that can draw on literature, on history, even on science you know, to draw on the larger world. And this, to me, is the great promise of a university, because it has all of these food groups around. And you can sort of dip into them, and you can get something out of them. And I think the kinds of writing that, that is most exciting to me are, are, is the kind that, that, that's well-written. It's not obfuscated. It's not sort of <coughs> root-bound in, in a kind of scholarly jargon, but it borrows from uh, worlds of expertise of, of, and different disciplines that really make it resonate. 
when I look at these books, uh, if we take Brown, uh, the biography <coughs> of, of Jerry Brown, and then the most recent one, uh, to me, there, there's a growth sounds presumptuous, but I can't think of a better word. No, I think it's uh, true. In, in your style, <coughs> Uh, and I think one thing that I see, and what I want to find out whether, whether you agree with it, is that you are more willing to let sentences sort of flow and incorporate a lot of things. And you're also more willing to be biting. Uh, I noticed that uh, in, in the last books in particular. You're, you're much more willing to, to let people hang out there to dry based on their own words and, and to include in your sentences uh, you know, adjectives and adverbs that, that really that, that convey you know, a certain attitude on your part uh, that was not always apparent in Brown, but sometimes it showed up. Is that, is that correct or is well, that? Well, it may be. I, I mean, I do like a certain wryness, and I think irony is a, is a highly prized tool for any writer. Um, on the other hand, I do strongly believe that writers have to allow their readers to come to their own conclusions. And so I do resist attitude, uh, and my editor is always slashing and burning, you know, through my, you know, to, to, to precisely to remind me that the, that, that the best writing, you know, has a point of view, but it doesn't beat you over the head with it. And y y what you want to do is to get the reader to end up where you are through artfulness, <clears throat> not through ideology, not through sort of bludgeoning. So. Um, I mean, some of the stuff in virtual Tibet, I mean, when I start writing about someone like the action pick star Steven Seagal, I mean, it's really hard to, to kind of be totally, you know, sort of value free about it. The guy is an amazing crackpot, you know. And, uh, <laughs> Should we just skip to him? Because I wanted to do a little bit. I wanted, to, I, you know, you're going to make me lose complete. <laughs> Where, where I want to go, but I think we should skip to him. I, I, isn't, isn't there something on the sheet? Um, I, I want to do it in two, I do it in okay. two ways. One is your description and, uh, of him. I believe that's on this. Someone tell me. Top of the, Top of the Thank you all. See, this is meant to be interactive. Uh, <laughs> a meaty six foot tall man, Steven Seagal, wears a yellow broke. Oh, there's a typo in this one. Someone's already caught it. Don't feel like you're special if you caught it. <laughs> Uh, wears a yellow brocade Chinese style silk jacket with a high mandarin collar embroidered with golden dragons. His hair is gathered in a close cropped pigtail and he clutches an elaborate, that is the typo, Tibetan talisman of silver that looks like a small lantern. He is accompanied by a complement of hefty gum chewing retainer bodyguards in dark suits. A retinue that makes him look somewhere between a 1950s Banana Republic potentate and a mutant Gilbert and Sullivan Mikado. It's <laughs> truly one of my favorite sentences, although I discovered <laughs> That, that younger people think Banana Republic means he's dressed in those, oh, yeah. <laughs> those, those things. So uh, there's that. Now the question for you is, based on what you just said about your editor slashing out, I understand that this is pure description. But it also seems to me like you could have described him another way and he would have sounded better. Well, let's just say I kind of ran away with myself there. I mean, you know, sometimes you can't resist. Um, <laughs> and I mean, you know, metaphor, simile, yes, it has a certain prejudicial cast to it. So you admit it. That's oh, all I we mean, care and about. I, I, I think a little humor is never ill-advised. Then, uh, since we're still on him, I had, he came up in two different parts. By the way, for those of you who don't know, Steven Seagal, whose movies you doubtless have seen because they play like loops on cable television, he believes that he is a reincarnate uh, lama, a tulku. Uh, and, uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> really, you have to buy the book because <laughs> it's really wonderful. Um, so we have your description of him. But then we have, this actually will answer some of the questions they may have. This, this is a quote by him. So the, the question is sort of the same. You've, you've picked out this, this quote. Um, you were, you were interviewing him. I've kept my spiritual, remember who we're talking about, Stephen? Okay. I've kept my spiritualism secret because people don't understand it. Friends have never gotten this part of my life, but there are many great lamas who recognize me as someone strange, and I believe that's absolutely true. Uh, 
and from another time, who refer to me as one of them. I feel a deep kinship beyond words with them, something really deep. People all over the world come up to me and recognize me as a great spiritual leader. Um, I don't know if I have a question so much as, did you just sort of, did your heart leap up when he said that? Because you thought this is just, this is too perfect for? Well, I mean, <clears throat> in a certain sense, you have to be very careful with people like that, too, because, you know, they can, they're already parodies of themselves. So you, 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 you don't want to put it over the top. I mean, you have to kind of almost mute it down. I mean, in his case, uh, you know, I, I spent some time with him. And I mean, you also have to try to extract from it what it all means. And, and what it all means is there are a lot of people in the West who have a very rich fantasy life. And some of them choose to project that fantasy onto Tibet. And that was what interested me. And so he was a kind of a very, you know, in your face example of this. And uh, somehow I think he imagined that his incredibly violent side, he could sort of use an antidote of Tibetan Buddhism to somehow moderate it or balance it out a little bit. I mean, the, the guy was, you know, we're all seeking, we're all trying to lead our lives, and I think this was his sort of strange answer to what clearly was a, a, was a really complicated and, and, and disturbing life. Don't worry, we're going to come back to, to him and some of those other things. I want just a, a couple of minutes on <clears throat> grammar. And this is not necessarily because I'm a writing teacher. It seemed to me, reading your books, that you are that you're a master of grammar. There's one sentence that's a paragraph long that uses a series of semicolons. It's a description of the Dalai Lama. Um, you seem to use an occasional fragment, uh, which I assume a lot of people think is is illegal and immoral. Uh, lots lots of little things like like that. Um, you begin sentences with and and but. Another thing that people learned in the sixth grade is, is wrong. And I think my favorite thing in all of your books is I found only one exclamation point. Really? Only one. And I was it's probably my editor at work. Thrilled that there was <laughs> there was just one. So, do, do, I guess the question is how how important is? I mean, do you really think grammar is important? Uh, that's a really stupid question, the way you know, I, I think. Uh, I mean, I think grammar is important, but I think actually sort of an, an elegant sentence, and you can hear it after a while. I mean, when you do it enough, and you, you, you sort of know. And my, my, my kids go to a French school, you know, and they're little, and they speak French with utter, and it's just so easy for them. You know, they don't have to think about it. And so for me, I think it is not a question so much of, I don't always know what I'm doing, but, but I, I kind of know how it sounds. And that is, to me, is probably, and, and I actually do read things out loud when I'm going over final proofs, because you can kind of hear it. Um, so um, sometimes I'm not sure I know the rules very well, but you kind of learn the rules as you would learn a language without knowing how to do the subjunctive. You just say it. Would you just, for emphasis, say again that you read it out loud? Yeah, I read it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> makes a big makes a big difference. Uh, another quick thing uh, on titles. Mm. You seem to devote quite a bit of time to the titles. I'm amused by all the titles. One of the reasons I included the selected articles, uh, these weren't selected for their content. <clears throat> I'm embarrassed to say they were selected just for their titles. Uh, Dragons and Dungeons: The Great Mall of China, Breaking China. Uh, running dogs and credit cards, but it's not just the titles of the articles. It's the the chapter titles in in the books. What do you what do you want your titles to do besides, in this case, amuse us, which they do? But I assume that there's there's more to it than that. Well, I think a t title should evoke somehow uh, what's in the piece, and also I think that to have them, you know, you don't want to have them sound like something that. Chairman Mao wrote, you know, on the correct handling of contradictions between the people. I mean, <laughs> you know, you want to have it a little more pithy. And I think <clears throat> the kind of writing that I do does allow that to happen. Maybe in academic writing, it's less possible, uh, or in newspaper writing. So, um, you know, 
the one book I had a terrible time with was the book that ultimately was called Mandate of Heaven before Virtual Tibet. And, you know, the publisher, Simon & Schuster, uh, the one thing I said to them, this was about 1989 in China and afterwards, I said, uh, you know, no dragons and no pearls, you know, in the title. I mean, these are the two most hackneyed, corny thing you can think about. Well, you know, they came up with about 50 titles, all with the dragon and the pearl, the pearl and the dragon, the this, that, and the other. Finally, a friend of mine, uh, and you read the title to it, uh, ultimately used it in an article. He said, how about calling it Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> Which I thought was a wonderful title, but it was a little much. Uh, so we didn't use it on the book. So it's always fun to think up titles for chapters and books at the end and to try to get something that sort of you know, koan-like in its ability to, you know, make people pay attention. So I, I like what you said, that it's fun, because that, I mean, you do try to balance this, catch their attention and, and have it yeah. with, with some substance. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk for, for a while about style, and I want to read one of your sentences. <clears throat> Again, it's a sentence I, I love. Uh, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not on your sheet. Don't go looking on your sheet. Tibetan nomads may keep many of their effects tucked, in, tucked inside their chubas uh, against their bodies and are capable of astounding the uninitiated with the strange inventory of things they can produce from within, somewhat in the fashion of a magician pulling outlandish objects out of a hat, a plastic bottle of yak yogurt, a pack of cigarettes, a box of rifle cartridges, a can of pineapple, even a half-eaten leg of mutton. <laughs> I mentioned at the beginning that, that your writing provoked me to do analysis and math. I, I ran this through my grammar checker uh, on, on my computer, which I've, I've never used before. And uh, this, is, this is what it, it came up with. The grammar problem is long sentence, no suggestions. Uh, but at least there was no passive voice. And then it gave two, two scales. The, which I was not familiar with, the, the flesh Kincaid grade level scale and the flesh reading ease scale. Uh, the grade level scale was uh, 12. Uh, what, what's the range? Well, 12 is just, that's grade level. I'm go now oh, going to do the grade. range. Now I'm going to do the range. This was my favorite. The reading ease scale, um, the formula, it, before I give you the answer, remember yours was zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's zero to 100. Uh, the Reader's Digest scores 65, Time Magazine 52, Harvard Law Review 32. Uh, most states require insurance documents to score between 40 and 50. So 100 is perfectly readable. Mm -hmm. Zero apparently means completely unreadable. <laughs> and, and I got a zero? And you got a, you got a zero. <laughs> so so, so I guess, so I don't know, what, do you ever... <laughs> So are you happy or sad? I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite astounding. I well, actually thought you should be proud uh, of, of that. Um, I mean, it's sort of cryptic praise. Right, but I think, but I think it's actually high cryptic praise. <laughs> on, on your uh, program, there is another one that I ran through, <clears throat> and it's the second half of the, the first quotation. Um, I can't pronounce the Russian's name, Prezhovsky. Oh, Prezhovsky. Prezhovsky. And this is perhaps my favorite sentence uh, that you have ever written, and I like <laughs> well, a lot of them. Better. <laughs> this, is after, this is after talking about what uh, uh, this uh, Russian explorer is bringing as, as gifts for everyone, uh, including I really liked the uh, uh, photos of Russian stage stars uh, because we knew the Tibetans. He's on his way to Lhasa. He's on his way to Lhasa. Um, for the Dalai Lama, Przewalski planned something more personal, wild strawberry jam that he himself had made. Just in case his gifts did not do the trick, however, he also packed enough powder to blow up a good chunk of the potala. <laughs> uh, I like the, the end of that. Then it's the next sentence. Always impressed by a nicely done preserve, the British were perhaps fearful lest Przewalski's cache of strawberry jam turned the Dalai Lama's head towards St. Petersburg. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, anyone who can get that opening modifier uh, that way. Uh, but you should know your reading ease went way up on that because it was a shorter sentence. Yeah. You're almost at 50%. Well, so. I, I probably read too much Marcel Proust. I hate to think what would happen if you put him through with this Richter scale. <laughs> it would probably just disintegrate. Blow the fuse. Right. <laughs> yeah. So. But that's sort of the lead into talking some things about, about style and uh, 
you mentioned irony uh, that you that you like that, and in fact, uh, in discos and democracy, early on, you you say irony and incongruity, as they have been since liberation in 1949, abound in China today. One of the things I notice in all of your books is how much you enjoy irony and incongruity. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite passage is, again, if you look on the bottom of, of the first page of, of the sheet, um, at a firing range for foreigners specializing in submachine guns, anti-aircraft machine guns, and so on, this is uh, a this videotape. Is Beijing. This is in Beijing. A videotape blinked on a TV monitor standing just beneath the Alpine painting. Earlier, he had described this room filled with these incongruous uh, paintings. Uh, Please accept our most cordial welcome. We hope that your experience here will give you a happy memory, said a cartoon figure in stilted English as classical piano music rippled in the background and pictures came on of happy foreigners firing contentedly away with sundry automatic weapons at targets made up to look like the rough outline of humans. Friendship brings together all of us of different colors and different languages, continued the video narrative as an inferno of flame from an exploding anti-tank rocket blasted a small shed to smithereens. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was a, uh, I mean, this was, uh, I was investigating sort of capitalism arriving in China, and one of the excrescences of this new capitalist revolution was someone had set up a range where you, you could go out and shoot and blow things up. It was the ar army had done this to make some money, so I went out one day to have my hand at it. And, uh, so the question is what, besides that it's terrifically amusing and, and interesting. What, what is there about irony um, <coughs> and, and the, the juxtapositions that, that you like so much that, that moves what you're trying to say forward? Well, I guess, you know, uh, I mean, having spent so much time reading about China in China, I mean, I can't think of any country, at least in its communist guise, that has less sense of irony. I mean, it's just appalling when you read these party directives and all of the stuff that comes out. There's not there's just a scintilla of irony anywhere. So I think that kind of makes me want to just get in there and you know, kind of load up with irony. Um, but I, it's a wonderful device. I mean, it's, it's, it's a way that writers can sort of um, be subtly funny. And juxtaposition for me is the staff of life. I mean, I, 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 that's the way I try to see the world, you know, where things are colliding, they don't fit, you know, people don't belong, I and mean, systems are, are somehow trying to merge, and they just are so different, and it's what got me interested in Tibet. I mean, it's so different, Tibet is so unlike any other place, so unlike China, and here, yet China occupied Tibet, and claims that it's theirs, and yet they just had some fundamental level don't understand what's going on in Tibet. And that, that interests me. And would you say uh, that that's actually the, the, the structure of virtual Tibet, the structure of the book? Yes. That it really is irony and juxtaposition. Yeah, in a funny way, I, I suppose I had to put it in one sentence. The problem of Tibet is that the Chinese have a virtual version of having liberated this place. You know, the oppressive, feudal society with theocrats drinking blood out of skulls and oppressive landlords and aristocrats with serfs and you know they get in there and revolutionize it. On the other hand the West has its version but then there's poor Tibet sitting up there uh, waiting for deliverance. A great, one of the great tragedies of this century and the last century and there's no no hope of resolution and part of the reason I think is that we have such different visions of it and they're so opposite and collide in such a di diametrically opposed way that neither side can yield and neither side can compromise and, and it's sad. It's, it's, it's an enormous tragedy. As we all know who've read parts of this because of the tear in the corner of Sharon Stone's eye uh, listening to the Dalai Lama, we felt her, her pain. Uh, how did, how did you arrive, I don't even know if you can answer this question, how did you arrive at the organization of Virtual Tibet? That is the, the sort of two interweaving <coughs> stories, your own get, trying to get to the set um, and the history of people trying to get into Tibet. 
It was a really painful process. I mean, and I had no idea where I was going for a couple of years. I mean, I was going down to Hollywood, realizing that Hollywood was now really fascinated with Tibet, and I really needed to understand why that was happening, what they were doing, what they made of it. I also knew that in some way I wanted to do some history, and then I wanted to get on these movie sets. And, I, and it was just, it took months and months and months of wrenching things around, trying different uh, sort of sculptures of the book. To, to get this idea of the journey to Tibet that people have been trying to make for centuries, parallel in some way my journey to get Hollywood to let me go on the, to this fake set of Lhasa, and then interweave throughout that all of the historical journeys and what people imagined and what they sought, why they too over the last few hundred years wanted to go to this unlikely place. So it was like shuffling three decks of cards together it was tough, and I went through many different permutations. And just for all of you who want to be writers, uh, you know, don't despair. I mean, this is the standard, standard <coughs> procedure. Was, was there a, a moment at which you suddenly realized that this is the organization, or did it, uh, I know you said there were lots of permutations, but did it, when it finally came, did it strike you as yet, this is the, this is the one? Well, I, there was a moment of recognition when I realized that, I mean, you, you have to understand Hollywood doesn't like writers like me to go on to their closed sets. Brad Pitt was down in Argentina shooting Seven Years in Tibet, and they just wouldn't let me go. So I began to get this idea, well, I'm being excluded just the way all of these other adventurers, explorers, you know, geographers, botanists, missionaries had been excluded from Lhasa. You couldn't go there. And I thought, ah, this is interesting. I'm just a little bit like this guy Sven Hedin, for instance, who I read some quotes from, who couldn't get to Lhasa ever. So I began to think, well, maybe my journey to this fake Tibet could be put in some sort of parallel with all of these efforts of other people throughout history to get to the real Tibet. Because actually, our Tibet is this virtualized version anyway. So that was a, mo that was a kind of a revelation. We're getting close to time where we need to leave room for, for questions, but I have a couple of things that I, w I <clears throat> must get, get through. Uh, openings and closings. Uh, you quote in the Jerry Brown book, you quote him about journalists, and, uh, they, and he says, if a journalist doesn't grab the attention of the reader in the first paragraph, he's lost, he knows that. Uh, and he goes on to equate that to, to politicians. How much do you, do you work on openings and closings? There's, there's a closing on here just for even a chapter that I thought was particularly nice. Do you devote special attention to those? Well, I think it is important, I mean, that, that the shape of a chapter and of a book be proper and it needs to open somehow and it needs to, it needs to have a closing. Uh, it may be a very different way of doing it than if, if you're just doing a report or a scholarly book, but I mean, all of that is part of the architecture of you know, a paragraph, a chapter, a book, whatever. And um, sometimes you can't see this and do this until you get pretty far along in the process towards the end. Then that's really the time to look at how you're beginning and where it is you want to end. So I think those things usually come pretty late in the process. And actually, I, th I think this is, a, a night, this is not the end of a book, but the end of one of the chapters from Virtual Tibet. Despite often Herculean efforts, none of the dauntless 19th century Western adventures ever reached the Mecca of Tibetan Buddhism. Instead, they were left to vie with one another for a far less lustrous consolation prize, who had gotten the closest, uh, which does actually sum up, I think, that chapter. Some, some quick questions. Who's, who's writing do you admire? Oh, boy. Uh, Whose writing do I admire? I see nothing, just. Well, you know, there are a lot of people. I mean, you know, I'm thinking of classical people, of, of contemporary people. Uh, you know, I'll tell you one thing I've just done, and it was a stunning experience. My brother, who's also a writer, Jonathan Shell, gave for my, me for my birthday this, the tapes for the new translation by Richard Fagels of The Odyssey, read by Ian McKellen, the great British Shakespearean. Well, you know, I've battled through the Odyssey and the Iliad at different times in my life, and I thought, oh boy, okay, there were something like 16 bloody tapes. Well, as an experiment, I started to listen with my wife and children. It is just beautiful. It is so extraordinary. 
And, you know, it, it, just hearing him read this wonderful translation of this great book, uh, that I certainly venerate. Uh, I recommend you all run out, probably only ten copies in the world, but, uh, and get these tapes. Um, it'll, it, you know, it'll make this, this literature really live for you in a way that it doesn't when you have to slog through it in a you know, basic English class. We're not going to get to my next 20. Oh. questions. <laughs> so l let's just end with, uh, is, is there anything you wish I would have asked or is there anything you'd like to, to say by way of summary? And if not, we'll just go to questions. Let me just go to questions. <coughs> questions. Do, do you want to uh, handle them? Okay, how about you? And, and will you all speak up so that we can try to pick it up on that? How do I decide what I want to write about? Um, you know, a, you have to really write about something you want to write about. And lamentably, uh, in the current state of affairs, editors tend to suggest to writers what they would like to have written, whether it's a magazine writer, even sometimes book publishers. You know, how about trying a book on this? And that, for me, is a real distortion of the creative process. It really should come from the writer themselves. So sometimes you don't have anything to write about. Uh, and sometimes you're kind of filled with, with ideas. You, it has to be something you want to know about. Uh, I want to know about what's going out there. Uh, <laughs> what, what is it? <laughs> yes. How do you know when it's, when it's absolutely time to put something down because you cannot get any farther? I mean, writer's mm. block is the common term. but. And then, and then when, how do you know when it's time then to go back and pick it up and work on it? And do you ever get to the point where it's like you've started something, you put it down, and you've not ever picked it up again? Yeah, I mean, actually, um, I, 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 I've written two things, book-length things that I've never done anything with. One was about a Russian ballet uh, dancer who was a defector quite a while ago, uh, Alexander Gudinov from the Bolshoi. Uh, for complicated reasons, I just junked it. Um, I also have written a novel that I intend to get back to but haven't. I think at some point after you stop working on something and put it aside, you do begin to be able to see it as an outsider would. And that's a very important moment so that you can actually uh, see it with a very different eye than you would when you were still wrapped up in it. Uh, I don't know what, whether I'll ever pick up that novel again. I, I'd like to. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, yes, being on what sets they did let you on in Hollywood, and, and I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, you know, seeing movies and plays, do you ever have the uh, craving or desire to see the dramatic representation of your words? Is that ever a, like, do you ever feel like writing a play or a screenplay, basically? <laughs> um, you know, Probably I wouldn't be very good at it. Uh, and also, you know, the thing about writing is that it's all yours. And the thing about filmmaking, it isn't. <laughs> and it's a terrible frustration because you, you may have a very keen sense of what it is you want to do or say or have shown, and yet it's a collaborative process. And it, it, you have to get in a very different mode, a much more collective mode. And, um, it's often very hard for writers who've had this extraordinary suzerainty over their work, sovereignty over their work. So I, I, I don't know. It's probably not where I'm. I mean, I've worked on films. You know, I've done a lot of documentary film work and some modest advising on other films. I, I don't find it that interesting. It's not where I'm strong. Uh, yes. Well, you know, I think it's actually, although it was rather bizarre when I first took this position as dean at the journalism school because I was just a writer, uh, it's actually been wonderful uh, for me. I, and I've really enjoyed uh, shaping an institution, which is something I'd never done. And I think at that, the stage of my life when I took it on, I, I knew enough about writing and what, what I would want to do to help students 
become better writers and journalists and even filmmakers. So uh, that, that, that had a certain logic to it. Now, maybe I'm wandering from your question. Um, What, what, what you would hope that your impact I think, I mean, I do believe on some fundamental level that a society that doesn't, can't think and can't talk to itself is, is a society that I don't want to live in. And when I look at the political debate that goes on these days, I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm just talking to zombies. And it, it really is distressing because not that the people are stupid, it's just that there's no space for the kind of sort of rumination and reflection that I think is so important and that I esteem in any human being and yet the process sort of steams it out of them. It's too risky, too dangerous. So I think, that I hope that some of the writing that I do can, you know, at least somehow facilitate a little of that, get people to, to think in a creative way, slightly off-center, unexpected, um, because the world is, just gets too sort of refined. Uh, and, and again, it's a great promise of a university, to, that, it, that a university can and should do this. And after all, we all have all this glorious tenure. I mean, we can afford to take risks, and we should. Yes, in back. Well, you know, I mean, I've been reviewed all kinds of different ways. Uh, no writer likes a bad review. Um, I mean, one thing I've learned is that, you know, it isn't as if it's a judgment from on, a, on high. Different reviewers feel different ways, and you just sort of have to learn to let it go. I mean, some, some people love what you do, some people don't. And, you know, it's where writers are incredibly exposed. I mean, most, I suppose, they f fire CEOs or they don't renew contracts for baseball players, but where, you know, writers really <coughs> are out there is, is in the review process. Um, I don't think you ever get good at being trashed in a review. Uh, but it does happen. And sometimes people just don't get it. And some reviews, you know, I've, I've had critical reviews that I actually have thought were, were right. And some I thought were completely out to lunch. There's some reviews that love your book and you think they, you don't have a clue about what you're writing about. Uh, you know, it's all over the lot. Uh, yes? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, can you all hear that, the, the reaction of China and exile community to this book? China always feels ambivalent about almost everything I write. Uh, and, you know, I've had a very complicated relationship with China uh, because they come from a different tradition, which is basically propaganda. So anybody who writes something that isn't dedicated to building friendship is, you know, difficult for them to, to feel good about. Uh, Tibet, I mean, I feel very sympathetic towards the cause of Tibet, but this book was not one that was received with, you know, enormous enthusiasm by uh, many Tibet supporters of the exile community because it was really, in a certain sense, I didn't feel that this was its intention, but I think they sometimes did, that it was casting aspersions on their ardor, the dedication of their commitment that maybe their view of Tibet was, was somehow through rose-tinted lenses and thus not worthy, which wasn't my intention. I think Tibet is a very worthy topic. It's a, it is a great tragedy, as I say. But on the other hand, I, I'm committed to sort of free inquiry. And my free inquiry led me down this path to examine why we care so much, so deeply. Uh, not that it isn't worthy of caring about, but it, that, that there's some other quality to it that did seem to me to bear scrutiny and that might possibly have some bearing on how we could solve this thing. And I do think there is a bit of projection. 
mythologizing, and that's what the book sought to unravel. I think we probably need to stop there, but maybe you can stay a couple of minutes in case people do have, sure. have questions. I can't thank you enough. This well, has been you, absolutely Steve. wonderful. Thank you.